All right, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's uh, time we get going through another wonderful Friday afternoon. I hope uh, everybody's doing all right today. Uh, we're going to get going uh, because uh, today we kind of have a two-parter. Uh, I think having sort of chewed on this a little bit, what we'll do is I'm going to go over some of the stuff that I want to show you for the um, uh, it, in the section first, only because it sort of is relevant to the Gaia reading exercise that we have laid out for you. Uh, so the thinking is, you know, maybe if you hadn't quite uh, put together some of the pieces here, maybe the thing that I'm going to show you here will help connect up and you'll be a little bit faster and more efficient as you go through the exercise. So what we'll do today is I'm going to show you a little demonstration of Gaia uh, isochrone fitting uh, and sort of what that means uh, using glue, because it's something that'll show up on homework set four. And then after that, we'll go into this reading exercise. I'll break you up into uh, breakout rooms and it will count towards participation marks. Uh, so I'll let you all uh, sort of settle things out at that point. But to get going, um, are there any questions that have come up? I don't see any, so maybe I can prompt a couple by noting a few logistical points. We have a homework set due uh, at 5 p.m. today. We have a midterm in almost exactly one week. Uh, yeah, now it's 102, so exactly one week from now we'll be starting a midterm. And um, then I'll post homework for the rest of chapter three and... Yeah, that's enough. I'm also writing the midterm this weekend, but you know, you don't get to see that till Friday. Uh, anyways, uh, so the, the that'll all sort of come out this weekend so that when we hit Monday, we'll cover some stellar pops and stuff. But all of that stuff is on midterm two, not midterm one. So at this point, you can just start studying what we've covered up through Wednesday. Uh, I'll send out a formal announcement today kind of outlining the expectations for the midterm exam. Okay, well, Enough blah blah. Let's go go. Um, so, oops, that's definitely not a button we wanted. Uh, there it is. Awesome. So, what I wanted to talk about today was this process that we call isochrone fitting, and you probably saw something about that when you were going through your um, uh, Gaia reading exercise, just to kind of put the. Uh, uh, thinking of it together. And so the idea in isochrone fitting is that we're going to try to determine the properties of what we call a simple stellar population. And a simple stellar population is a group of stars that formed all at the same time from gas at the same metallicity. So all the stars come together, they get formed, and they get formed through the star formation process, and then they have a distribution of masses. So all the stars share the same age, the same metallicity, but they all have different masses. And this means that they are all going to evolve at a rate that's set by their initial mass, uh, with high mass stars evolving quickly and low mass stars evolving more slowly. Uh, so we are going to get a range of uh, stellar uh, sort of types you know, different stages of stellar evolution because they're all going to be following a different, uh, uh, they are all following their own evolutionary tracks. So these look a lot like the evolutionary tracks that I showed you last week, I guess earlier this week too, but they are all the same age. So they look similar, but they're not quite the same thing. They're very complementary to evolutionary tracks. An evolutionary track follows one star over the course of time, this is a whole bunch of stars at a fixed time. And the reason why we care about st simple stellar populations is that clusters are the prototypical simple stellar populations. We think that all the stars in a cluster of stars formed at the same time with the same metallicity. There's an asterisk on this because we see sometimes multiple populations inside clusters, and that's kind of a cool corner uh, edge case for study, but we really sort of understand populations here. So this is a picture from the article uh, in the section that you were supposed to read for today, and it shows off uh, this cluster precipice in the Gaia color magnitude diagram, and it shows you this little red line and it says that the log age is 
which means that it's eight to, 10 to the 8.85 years old, and it has a metal SDZ of 0 0.02, which is about the um, uh, solar metallicity. So we see this nice little red line, and that goes through here. And the advantage of this is that you can use the uh, properties of a cluster and these isochrones to figure out the ages and metallicities of populations. And if you figure out the ages of populations, you start to be able to look back in time in the galaxy and understand where our stars are coming from. So I'll show you now some isochrones. Uh, these are isochrones that are generating you generated using theoretical stellar evolutionary tracks. Uh, they are the points on the HR diagram, either in this one, which is the luminosity temperature diagram, or the color magnitude diagram, that shows a simple stellar population at a time tau after its formation. And there's really uh, three ingredients that go into this stellar population that you see here. Uh, the first, of course, is the age. And because stars uh, evolve uh, kind of with this main sequence lifetime, that's a power law, like we derived, it's roughly, you know, the main sequence lifetime is the stellar mass to the negative 2.5 power. Uh, the log of the age is a very natural way to describe those time scales. Uh, because it's uh, sort of the high mass stars evolve relatively quickly and low mass stars take orders of magnitude more time. So the log kind of compresses that age scale into a set of numbers. The other things we see are uh, the metallicity and the alpha to iron ratio. Uh, for the stars. And these are using this bracket notation that we see. So Fe on H, as I'll often say, call it, is just a representation of how many heavy elements there are relative to the hydrogen. Uh, and it is normalized to the solar value on a logarithmic scale. So zero corresponds to solar metallicity, negative numbers are subsolar, and positive numbers are metal enriched relative to solar. So let's... Uh, uh, and then this alpha over E is Fe is controlling the relative abundance of alpha process elements, which are carbon, oxygen, neon, uh, relative to iron peak elements like iron and silicon. And that's kind of telling you a bit about stellar population evolution. Uh, but we'll take this as zero, meaning we just kind of lock it to the solar value. And so then we get uh, the figure that you see here. This is a simple stellar model, and then we they've laid over a theoretical atmosphere on top of it. And then you are sampling this into the uh, Gaia uh, photometric bands. And so what you see uh, here is each of these tracks is color coded by the age of the stellar population. And so if we looked at the stellar population at 1 million years, which would be ten, a six on this scale, it would follow that really dark blue curve. And then as we watch the stellar population over time, the, you would see the stars would be found along these points uh, as it sort of kind of, I think of it almost like a wick burning down, like it sort of burns down the main sequence and then you populate the red giant branch and stuff. And then the little circle that you see annotated there is the end of the main sequence lifetime uh, for or the, the stars that are, at the highest mass stars that are still on the main sequence in each of these uh, uh, isochrones. So that's sometimes called the main sequence turnoff point. So we're going to actually look at isochrones in the context of Gaia data. And so the, um, you can follow along at home for this if you want to open up E-Class and Gaia and sort of follow along with what I'm doing. Uh, you'll be asked to do it later, or then you can sort of see uh, the process here. Uh, but in the E-Class data, uh, there are these files uh, called isochrone fe. Uh, zero log t of 7.0.csv. And they're just data files that represent the isochrones for a simple stellar population. Uh, the fe means Fe on H, or the iron metallicity. And so fe 0, 0.0 is 0, 0.0. And then log t is the age. And so this is the 10 million year isochrome. And you can find these if you go to, oops, wrong, I want this, yeah. If we go on to E-Class and you go over here, I've stuck them in the open cluster Gaia data. 
And what we have are a bunch of open clusters derived from the same data, from the same paper that you're looking at, and then a bunch of these isochrones, uh, which we'll sort of look at. So you can go ahead and grab one. If you're going to grab one and follow along, grab the 9.0 for reasons. But anyways, uh, yeah, so these are kind of indicated where F E on H is indicates the metallicity. And because you don't want to include hyphens and in file names a lot of the times, uh, a negative value is sort of F E on H M 0.5. So that's minus 0.5. And then perhaps shockingly, if it's positive, it's P 0.5. Uh, log T is ne never negative in these data values. So 9.5 would be 3.2 gig years. So we're going to get these files and they're basically just a big spreadsheet of uh, uh, files with a bunch of information on them. And what it shows you is the masses of, uh, or it shows you where a star of a given mass is in the HR diagram. And uh, so for a fixed age. And so this uh, isochro, uh, the, the columns here, I'll just sort of go through them. Uh, more when we're looking at this, but I'm putting this up here so you have a list of those. Uh, so the first part of the properties here are like the initial mass, stellar mass, effective temperature, surface gravity, and luminosity. Those are the properties of the stars that control their uh, um, stellar evolution. And then these have been sampled with a model atmosphere into the Gaia bands. And so that the key things that we want are Gaia G DR2 Rev. DR2 is data release 2. Revised is the revised photometry standards. And so BPRP are the absolute magnitudes in the BPRP bands. And then I've also calculated the color for you in this BPRP uh, value. So what we're going to do is take some of these files and hop on over into glue. That's not glue, but that's glue. And so what I've done uh, is I've downloaded a cluster file called the Hyades. Uh, and that's here. And I can throw the Hyades in here and make a HR diagram. And go through that and boom, that's the Hyades HR diagram. We're really good at this at this point. Whew. And so what I'll do is I want to put the isochrones on them. So let's take a look at the isochrone file here. So I'm going to pull this over and look at this in a table browser first. Ah, uh, that is not a table browser. Let's try this again. That's a table browser. And so what you see is that there's each of these files, EEP, isochrone age, etc., and goes through. And you'll notice that the thing that's increasing here is this initial mass column, 0 0.1, 0 0.10, 0 0.103, blah, 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 and goes all the way up to a whopping 2.32 uh, uh, here. So these are uh, the file, uh, these are uh, the files here. Um, and so this is the actual masses of uh, the stars here. And then the current mass of the star after mass loss is accounted for here, effective temperature and luminosity. But what we really care is where each of those stars are in the Gaia bands. And so to connect uh, these two files together, oops, that's the thing that we were talking about there. We need to glue them. And you got to say uh, this BPRP and this MG, those are the same thing. So treat it as such. So if you go into link data, you get a nice little linking file here. So I'm going to take the Heidi's Gaia data and I'm going to connect it to this isochrone F E on H of 0, 0.0 log T of 9. I'm going to get those two together. And I'm going to say that BPRP is the same thing as Gaia BPRP glue. And then MG is the same thing as Gaia G DR2 Rev glue. And then those two things appear on the same plot. And uh, it's a little uh, hard to see all of it. 
So what I'll do is I'll kind of zoom in like that. And it very helpfully plots it in colors that I can't distinguish. So I'm going to make this one, I don't know. I think maraschino sounds delicious today. Okay, so there we are. Uh, this is an isochrone. So each of these points on the isochrone is where a given star is in the Gaia HR diagram after 1 billion years. So we start the stellar population clock and it runs and it goes forward. And this is where everything is. And you can see that a lot of things are on the main sequence here. There's this little hook. There's a red giant branch, a bunch of you know jaggy stuff back here where it's going through uh, red giant sequence evolution. And then we see this white dwarf cooling sequence uh, that heads on over here and connects very nicely into uh, the white dwarfs here. Uh, it's You can do some neat little things in plotting this. Um, you can, for example, say that I want, I don't want the points, but I want to just show that as a line. And that makes it a little nicer and cleaner to see uh, through all of that. A uh, question came up in the chat. What is the bend corresponding to? Uh, I think uh, like this, this big bend out here. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know which one it is. So this one here. This is the subgiant branch, and then this is the red giant branch here. Um, so this is where it's kind of the after the main sequence. This is the main sequence turnoff, and then this is where the stars kind of head as the um, core is sort of contracting and becoming degenerate. And what's kind of neat about this, and one of the things why I do love glue, and you know, it's it's uh, rough in some ways but I can uh, actually put the points on here. And instead of plotting them all as a bunch of red points, I can do something like say, I want the uh, color of those points to be a linear scale. And I want it to show phase. Boop. And I need a good color map. Let's go, I don't know, Inferno today. Yeah, sure, you can sort of see that. And what's neat about this is it's color-coded each phase corresponding to the star's life, where the sort of darker blue thing is the main sequence, then there's the red giant branch, and then the helium burning sequence, the asymptotic giant branch, and then the white dwarf cooling sequence. So that's kind of cool. And then you can uh, change the size of these things to be linear and say scale with, nope, I don't want EEP. I want initial mass. And so then this is showing you a, a size that is proportional to the initial mass of the star. So all of the high mass stars are over here, and then the low mass stars are still down on the main sequence. So it really starts to make sense. It's really uh, neat to see all of these pieces. But uh, let's take those off for now and we'll revert the color to a fixed color because what I think is actually kind of important for this isochrone fitting is to illustrate the different ways that things change. So I plotted a billion years old, so log t of nine, and solar metallicity. But instead, I could make the link, and this is a little tedious, uh, so uh, bear with me. If I make the link between log t of 8.5 and the Hyades Gaia data, I can make the same links here. Glue and glue. Uh, and then I can drop that isochrone on here. And I will, oops, nope, I want to, uh, I want, oh, I'm changing the wrong one. That's the issue. I want the line, and I want that to be blue today. Make it blue. Yeah. Okay. So what I've plotted here is the isochrone for a younger stellar population. So this is 300 million years, a factor of three lower than the other one. And you'll notice uh, that the big difference here is that this little uh, hook goes up to higher values. And it's not really touching where the stars on the main sequence are. Let's do a little, let, I said, let's do a little zoom in there. And you'll see that the stars are kind of hooking around in this area instead of this kind of 8.5, 
benign and let's just for completeness throw in a 9.5. I got to glue those data so we'll take the 9.5 and glue those and we'll uh, my thinking here was that then this would be oh no I, I'm gluing the wrong thing stop group I need to glue a hiatus to 9.5 yeah BP RP glue MG uh, G glue Book. And then I can glue the 9.5 data on there, and it all just pops right up so nice and neat. And there I can make that align and shut off the points. And you'll see that this 9.5 data set uh, goes and it would go farther down the main sequence. So this is what we're really fitting is the top of the main sequence and the stars at this so-called main sequence turnoff point. Those are the things that are giving us a good constraint on the age. But you may be kind of thinking that I said, nope, that's the wrong button. There we are. Uh, there we are. Oh. You may notice that all oh, these nice main sequence curves kind of run down like this. Oh, this is great. Oh, crap. Main sequence up here, not down there. So it doesn't look like the best of fits given these data. And part of that's the model. But part of that is that we haven't quite explored all of the data space. There's the metallicity axis as well. And so what we can do is we could let's let's uh, go stick with our nine and then do some more glue in. Let's glue the Hyades data to the low metallicity data. So this is Fe on H of negative 0.5, log T of 9. And if I do that, do some gluing. Boop. And as long as we're in here, you might know where this is going. I'm going to glue the plus 0.5 data as well. And so this is a slightly metal rich population. And uh, those are glued, and I can throw those onto the file as well. So there's the minus, and there's the plus. So, uh, yeah, those actually look a little better. And here we're going to make it a line, and we're going to pick a color. I don't know. What do we feel like for color? Mm, there's so few things that I can distinguish effectively. All right. And then, oh, where's my other plot? There it is. So that's the high metallicity population. And then I can uh, change the color for the low metallicity population. Ooh, asparagus. Yeah, there we go. And so you'll notice that this high metallicity population does a little bit better job of actually fitting the main sequence down here, but it doesn't do quite as good of a job in the main sequence turnoff area. So you kind of have to trade off ages versus metallicities uh, to kind of get a good agreement across the whole uh, population. But eventually you come down to a fine agreement. Now, I'm not going to ask, like you can do this down to three significant figures uh, interpolating the isochrones, but I don't think that's a really good idea. So what I'll ask you to do is to pick a cluster from the open cluster data and kind of find the values of metallicity and age that are a good approximation uh, to what the cluster is supposed to be given the Gaia paper. So that's kind of an introduction to how people actually fit isochrones. And so we would look at this and we'd say, all right, these are all okay, but in the end, this looks does a reasonably good job of kind of going through the main sequence turnoff of catching my, uh, oops, did I, I did the wrong one, there we are, of catching the things on the red giant branch and getting over to the white dwarf cooling sequence in the right place. So this cluster is probably a billion years old and has somewhere between solar and super solar metallicity. So that's kind of the thing we did. So we managed to look at a bunch of stars, figure out how old they were, and uh, their chemical composition. Seems, seems like good work for the day. Any questions on that? I just yammered at you for 20 minutes, and I'm sorry I tried to avoid doing that, but, you know, that's what we want to kind of get to.